thank you for having me here at Google and for coming to my talk today. Uh, I'm a fan of many of the things that you're doing. I'm a huge fan uh, in particular because the company is data driven in many ways and also in the ways that I particularly care about in its work on diversity and inclusion and generally in its talent management. So with that, um, kind of, I hope this is going to resonate with you. What I was trying to do with the book was really bringing data and evidence to bear on a question on which many people are very passionate about. And I share that passion. But what I'm trying to argue is that we have to bring the same kind of rigor that we use to analyze unemployment or inflation to questions of gender equality. So, Here's what I want to do. I want to start out by kind of talking a little bit about why we might want to care. Then I want to talk about what we're up against. And I know you all, or many of you, have gone through unconscious bias training, so you will be familiar with much of that. And then I want to spend most of the talk uh, discussing how we can redesign our organizations to level the playing field and making it easier for all of us to do the right thing. So some of you might be here because they care about um, this pyramid here because you care about the absence of women in leadership. And then some others might be here because you care about even bigger questions. And I would actually suggest to you that this slide is the slide that you should most care about, even more so than the pyramid. The UN, in fact, now estimates that about 200 million women and girls are missing because of gender side. Gender side because of sex selective abortion or neglect in the first five years. Now, this in itself, of course, is tragedy, but I'm starting with it because a problem that many thought was too difficult to even address led to some really inspiring research. A colleague of mine, Rob Jensen, who is now at Wharton, went into India and exploited the fact that many call centers had moved into India in the 90s and they often hired women. So what he did was he ran an experiment, a field experiment, where he had treatment villages and control villages. And in the treatment villages, he offered service and training for women to go and work in call centers. And yes, he was interested in whether that would affect the likelihood that these women would go and work in the call center, but more importantly, he was interested in whether this affects how parents treat their zero to five-year-old daughters? Do even the poorest of the poor care about returns on investment? And that's what he found. So he measured survival chances. He measured body mass index, he and his team. Of course, he measured whether these girls then would be in school and really tried to understand whether parents started to treat their daughters better when there was a future for the daughters. And that's what he found was a long experiment over about 10 years, and he could show that economic opportunity actually can change how parents think about the value of having daughters without negatively affecting their sons. <coughs> and I think that's why we should care. We should really care because for some, this quite literally is a matter of life and death. But bringing you back to somebody who I think many of you know, this is Heidi Roizen. If you have gone through the unconscious bias training at Google, you might have encountered her. She is an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. And she was famous before a case study made her even more famous. And the case study, in an interesting way, made her famous because some colleagues of ours at Columbia Business School used this case to teach their students about bias in the moment. How this is done now across really this country and some other schools around the world is that half of the students would get the case with the protagonist being called Howard, and the other half would get the case with the protagonist having her real name, namely Heidi. And then students read the case, everything identical, and then rate Howard and Heidi. And again, you will have been there if you have done the training. We generally do think that both Heidi and Howard do a good job and are competent, but we do not like Heidi and do not want to hire Heidi because Heidi violates gender norms. That's what we're up against when we try to overcome some of these patterns that affect our thinking. 
But let me ask you to take a look at the pattern here that you see. Why don't you compare squares A and B for me? I presume most of you see square B as being lighter than square A. It turns out that this is an illusion. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to cover the surroundings here. And I presume that most of you now see the squares as having the identical color. I'm going to go back just quickly because you look at me puzzled. So here's what happened in your minds. Your mind made immediately sense of the pattern that it saw a checkerboard. And your mind knows that the light square has to be next to a dark square. And you also take a bit the shadow into account and correct for that shadow. So the question really in front of us is the following. What kind of patterns do we see in the world out there which keep us from seeing square B for what it really is, another dark square? So some creative interventions built quite directly on this. And you might have heard of orchestras, the larger orchestras in this country, introducing blind auditions. In the 70s, many major orchestras in the United States introduced curtains and had their musicians audition behind curtains. That increased the likelihood that women would be hired by 50%. Or put differently, blind auditions played a huge role in increasing the fraction of female musicians from 5% to now almost 40% on the major orchestras in this country. This is quite different from the roughly 10% female musicians, for example, in Berlin or uh, on the Vienna um, Symphony. So blind auditions are an attractive tool that, in fact, many organizations now increasingly rely on. Of course, not in terms of auditions, but in terms of blinding themselves to the demographic characteristics of the job applicants. But I want to use the blindness primarily as a metaphor for us. Because what we're trying to do here is really learn from these curtains for other types of design interventions which could make it easier for all of our minds to get things right. And that's where I want to take you today. In fact, before I talk about gender, I want to leave you with another metaphor which surely must be familiar to many of you. Most of you must have been in a hotel room where the room key card did not only serve the purpose to open and close the doors, but also to turn lights on and off. This is another little bit of technology, a little bit of design, which, make, which makes it easier for all of us who actually think that we care about the environment to follow through and leave the room when the lights are off. So that's where I'm going, trying to make it easier for us to do the right thing. And this, of course, is very, very different from other types of things that we have been doing and could be doing. It's different from diversity training. Now, clearly, diversity training is important for raising awareness. But as we all know, it is often hard to follow through because, by definition, these biases are unconscious. And even though I now realize that I will treat the male kindergarten teacher or the male nurse differently from their stereotypical counterparts who happen to be women, I can't guarantee that tomorrow when I see a male nurse, I will objectively evaluate that person. Seeing really is believing. So diversity training is a start. But I'm arguing that to really advance the needle and make a difference, we have to go deeper and do more. And yes. Trainings enabling traditionally disadvantaged groups to succeed have been shown to have some impact. But again, I don't think the solution can be to fix women or people of color or other underrepresented, underrepresented groups. But eventually, we have to move to fixing the system. So that's where I want to take you. I want to talk about three different topics that I touch upon in the book. The first one is talent management, something that everyone in this room and everyone across the globe, really, uh, that is listening to my talk today has been involved in, in some shape or form, either because you've interviewed for a job or because you were one of the people evaluating others. 
Then I want to talk a little bit about redesigning school and work and give you some examples of how that might be done. And then finally, I'll talk about possibly the hardest topic, and that is how to design diversity, how to make diversity really work. OK. So any talent management, of course, starts by attracting the right kinds of people. And curiously enough, we have been thinking about, for example, gendered advertisements for a very long time. Not just Coca-Cola, not just Pepsi, not, not just other soft drink companies, but all of us. We are kind of aware of the fact that some colors, for example, some shapes, some names, appeal more to women than to men or vice versa. In Coke's case, it was the word diet. Coke and other soft drink companies realized that men don't seem to be buying Diet Coke. It, of course, could have lots of reasons. Either men don't care about the calories they take, or they don't have an issue with calories, or they run more along the Charles River, or diet is not their word. So they replaced diet by Coke Zero, which was for men. Pepsi did the same thing, Pepsi Maxi, instead of Diet Pepsi, and of course, Gillette did the reverse when introducing Venus Gillette that comes in colors that resonate to people like me in pink. I argue that, I, I don't want to defend this in any way. I'm just describing that this is happening. But what I do want to argue is that we should use the same kind of scrutiny in our job advertisements. So here is an ad that a school posted which wanted to increase the fraction of its male teachers. So you probably know in the United States we now have about 10 to 15 percent male teachers in our elementary schools, which increasingly poses a problem for our boys because they no longer have male role models. So this ad looked like this, looking for a warm and caring teacher with exceptional pedagogical and interpersonal skills to work in a supportive, collaborative work environment. The adjectives that we highlighted, of course, are gendered and typically associated with women. And research suggests that this will, in fact, substantially decrease the likelihood that men will apply to these jobs. So an alternative ad could have looked something like this, looking for an excellent teacher with exceptional pedagogical skills. Now, of course, the school might say, but we really care about the caring. And if they do, that is OK. I'm not prescribing what schools or any organization for that matter should be doing. But what I am arguing is that we should do it consciously. Like we should understand what messages we send and send the messages that we do want to send and that are important to us in a conscious way. And that, of course, often means that we have to measure, that we have to collect the data and evaluate the impact of what, what we're doing. Now let me move on to somewhat higher hanging fruit. This is a hard one, and I know um, Google and your people in analytics groups have worried about this for quite a long time. Of course, what we're up against in evaluating people is that most of us believe that we are particularly good interviewers. And those of you who've read the book by Laszlo Bock will recall that among all the Googlers, there is this one outlier who is an amazing interviewer, and everyone is, else is just average. And that's kind of true for the world, that we all think are very good and will feel whether you belong or not, when in fact, what we're building our assessments on are these stereotypes and are these implicit assumptions that we often even can't articulate. In my case, for example, a real a moment of a wake-up call was when a job candidate, it's a real story, a job candidate and I started to talk about the fact that we both had been synchronized swimmers. And I felt immediately that, oh my god, that will make her an amazing Harvard professor. <laughs> now, we can't keep that from happening. And that's the problem with interviews. It's not that everything's just bad, but it's hard for us to distill the useful information from noise. And so I have this somewhat cheesy stock photo up here to suggest to you that almost everything that you see here is wrong. So the first thing that is wrong is that we shouldn't do panel interviews. We shouldn't do panel interviews because the sample size of a panel interview is basically one. These three people will not come up with independent assessments. And it's, of course, much better to have three separate interviews with three separate evaluations going on independently. 
A second myth is that diversity on the evaluation committee itself will solve our problems. Now, diversity can be helpful in that we might reach out to different networks and invite different people to apply to the jobs. But it doesn't protect us from implicit bias. Seeing really is believing. And if we don't see female engineers or male kindergarten teachers, we don't naturally associate those jobs with men or women, with, respectively. So diversity itself can't be the solution. Then thirdly, and now, of course, I'm in, um, uh, reading a bit much into this picture here, What's really important is that we always try to calibrate our judgments by forcing our minds to make comparisons. So why am I saying this? A very basic insight from behavioral science is that everything that you judge, everything that you evaluate, the coffee that you now drink or the water that you have um, in front of you has something to do with the kinds of coffees that you normally drink. That is your reference point or your reference coffee that helps you evaluate whether that's a good or bad coffee. Of course, we do the very same thing when we evaluate people. We tend to evaluate them compared to what we're used to in these specific professions or jobs. And so what we're trying to do is to overcome that need to rely on this internal little reference person sitting in our head who looks like the stereotype. And what we've been showing with a number of experiments is that when I force you to compare at least two, could be more, but at least two job candidates at the same time, you will be able to overcome your stereotypes and are much more likely to focus on these people's individual characteristics, um, their ability, what they bring to the table, rather than the groups that they belong to. So comparisons can be a powerful tool to calibrate your judgments. All of this, of course, hints at the fact that what we really should do is use a more structured process. And I was very happy to learn that Google uses many of these insights already in that you predetermine the questions that you want to ask. You ask all of your job candidates the same kinds of questions. You ask in the same order. And ideally, what we should also do is we should rate every question, every answer that we get after we've asked the question and then move on to the next question so that we're not biased by whatever the candidate responded to the first question that we asked. There's a number of these tools that I discuss in the book, and I'm actually quite excited because there are now these startup companies using some of these insights and translating them into the technology, which will make it easier for all of us to use more structured approaches to our hiring and evaluation processes. But of course, behavioral insights shouldn't stop at the entry level. And many of you will argue, going back to the pyramid, that the really big challenges start once you are in an organization. And let me give you kind of three quick thoughts on the kinds of things that we might want to change there. The first one is super trivial and um, won't, be, won't strike you um, as a surprise at all. And that is just measure the support that we give our employees to help them succeed. So just down the road here, MIT was one of the first institutions, one of the first academic institutions, I should, I should say, actually measuring the support that people got. And given that they're MIT, of course, the data spoke for itself. They literally used the measuring rod to measure people's office spaces, the laboratories they had available, the support staff, research assistants, resource resources, et cetera, and they found what then later was called performance support bias, which disadvantaged women. Now that, of course, again, is low-hanging fruit that we can fix right easily. It gets a bit more complicated when we think about performance appraisals. The first insight is that whenever I work with organizations, I typically find bias not so much when organizations evaluate past performance, which many organizations literally do on the x-axis, but typically when organizations also evaluate potential. Because potential, by definition, is forward-looking, and by definition, is very hard to measure. And that's where the Heidi bias, the leadership bias, kicks in, because we cannot imagine that women or other underrepresented groups who are not typically in the leadership um, positions would want to climb up the career ladders. So potential is uh, certainly something that you should be worried about. And if you want to use potential, what I typically try to argue is we, try, we should try to define as precisely as we possibly can 
what we really mean with potential and force ourselves to quantify it as much as we possibly can. And then thirdly and finally, um, we should stop sharing self-evaluations with our managers. Many organizations ask their, their um, employees to self-evaluate themselves, often on a rating scale, let's say from 1 to 10, and then ask the employees to share these evaluations with their supervisors. Now, a little bit of behavioral science already suggests to us that this will anchor the manager's assessments, because any numbers that I throw at you, whether in a negotiation or in performance appraisal, will affect your judgments. And if people differ in their self-confidence, that will affect the evalu evaluations that they end up with. These are just some ideas of how we can kind of fix and improve how we do our talent management. But let me go to some bigger questions. And this one might resonate with you um, in particular. Now, I don't see too many people who have recently taken the SAT in this room, but most of you will have taken it at some point. And might remember that part of the SAT is a multiple choice questionnaire. Now, think about the following thought experiment. If, in fact, people differ in their willingness to take risk, some people will be more willing to guess or volunteer an answer, and others will be more willing to skip the question. So generally, much, much research suggests that women tend to be more risk averse than men. And a former doctor school, doctoral student of mine, Katie Baldiga Kaufman, in fact, took this to heart and wanted to check whether that might cost the skippers points on the SAT because they weren't willing to guess. So she brought um, a large number of subjects to the laboratory. They participated in the SAT, but only in the multiple choice part of the SAT. And then, given that this was the laboratory, she could force everyone to answer every question. So she could take out the skipping option and thereby measure what people would have known had they answered all the questions. And what she found that was that for equally able people, controlling for ability, women are much more likely to skip and men are more likely to guess, which cost women dearly on the SAT. Now, the happy ending of the story is that this month, no, last month, it's already April, March 2016, um, as you probably have read in the news, the SAT has been redesigned. And one of the new design features is to debias the SAT, to gender debias the SAT. Really, in many ways, the first time in 100 years. The SAT now is trying to provide a level playing field. And it could have done many different things. The College Board ended up choosing to take away the penalties for guessing wrongly completely. In the old SAT, you got a point for uh, every right answer and a quarter point deduction for wrong answers. So a little bit of math um, suggested to people that if you had five possible answers available, if you can exclude one, then it is the dominant strategy to guess. But if people differ in their willingness to take risk, of course, the risk lovers will be more likely to guess than the risk avoiders. So the new test takes the penalty completely away, at which point the critiques, of course, said, oh my god, you're enabling guessing now, and you're inviting wild guessing by everyone, at which point uh, the answer must be, well, we have been inviting guessing by 50% of the population for about 100 years, and now we're making it legal for everyone to do so. So that's design. Design can be powerful, can really change how we do things and level the playing field quite um, dramatically. Uh, here's another example uh, that can be quite powerful, and that is literally the power of role models. I'm leaving the US for a moment because, interestingly enough and unbeknownst to many people, the longest running quota experiment has in fact been run in India, not in Norway or some other countries which recently have introduced quotas on its corporate boards. India amended its constitution in 1993 with the provision that a third of village heads had to be female. What was beautiful from a research point of view, the third was literally picked out of a hat, allowing researchers to evaluate what difference difference really makes. And a number of papers have been written in those 22 years, roughly. Um, but the one that I want to particularly focus on here was recently published in Science, suggesting that if a village has been exposed to two female leaders in those 22 years, mindsets are starting to change. And parents and girls are starting to associate political leadership with women. That's pretty dramatic. 
again suggesting that seeing really is believing. And that if we see counter-stereotypical people in those jobs, we can actually imagine ourselves in those jobs. And it has quite real implications. So I'm sad to say, this is my own institution, the Harvard Kennedy School, that only 11 years ago, we realized that all the portraits on our walls of leaders were of men. 50% of our students are female. And it wasn't our conscious intention to suggest to our female students that they were not made to be leaders. So we've changed that since. Um, this is Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the president of Liberia, also a graduate of the school. We commissioned a portrait of hers, Abigail Adams, uh, a number more to change the face, quite literally, of the Kennedy School and make it a more inclusive environment. Very serious research suggests that even what we see on our walls can affect our beliefs. And then, of course, there is some really happy news that uh, recently we've had a female protagonist, Rey, in Star Wars. And of course, that does matter in what we think is possible for ourselves. Sadly enough, and you probably have read about this, uh, it didn't transpire everywhere. Monopoly created a special version of Monopoly based on this particular episode of Star Wars and forgot to include the female characters. Now, Monopoly, I should say, has uh, fixed this since, um, but it's still remarkable that something like this is still possible. Now, let me move on to our last topic, um, how to design diversity, which I already announced is a really thorny topic. On the one hand, much evidence suggests that diverse groups outperform homogenous groups. But the tricky part is that when you ask people who participated in a diverse team how well they think the team performed and how enjoyable the task was, they will time and again report that they probably, the team probably didn't do so well and it wasn't really fun. Because diversity is hard work and of course because what we're trying to achieve by having diverse perspectives represented in a group is exactly what makes people uncomfortable. We want people to disagree. We don't want people to fall into group think and just run in the same direction because somebody said A was the right answer. And that makes diversity so hard. So let me give you kind of a few thoughts. So some is really old news. Yes, critical mass does matter. It does matter whether you're the only one of X the only woman, the only Swiss, the only economist, whatever it might be in a team. It does matter. You will be turned into a token, and you're also much more likely to perceive yourself as a token. So having three of X in a team, or roughly 30% in many cases, is helpful. But diversity is not just a numbers game. And I just want to end by highlighting this. It goes beyond numbers. Numbers themselves are very helpful and important, but we have to think about the decision rules, the rules of engagement uh, on our teams as well. And here's one that was a personal surprise to me, and that is political correctness. So I came from Switzerland to the US, and the Germanic culture is not a culture known for PC. And I have to tell you that initially I um, used all my stereotypes about Americans, thinking, oh god, this is very superficial this whole PC thing. Now, it turns out really serious research suggests it's actually working. Why? Let me show you a picture here and ask you the following question. Where would you be more likely to drop a piece of paper? Probably on the dirty beach. So what we see or what we hear signals something about the prevalent norms. And the question for us, therefore, really is, where would we, where would we be more likely to drop a dirty joke, not in a PC environment. So norms can matter, and how we present information can matter. And I have um, one of my favorite uh, uh, slides up here, which shows that on the, you know, on the happy note, learning really is possible. On the sad note, we have been using this pyramid for decades in this country to help us make more educated food choices. Now here is the deep insight. We do not eat off pyramids. This is the new image. It's a plate. And I'm sure it resonates with you that immediately you can see whether you eat too much dairy, too little dairy, too little protein, too much protein, 
things of that sort. All of us probably have some reflection, some reaction to what they see. For me, it's the dairy. I'm a dairy lover, and I'm still disputing the fact that this is so small. <laughs> but anyway, so here's Sam um, how we've used this information uh, to reshape some of the norms uh, in the gender diversity space. This is a cover from the UK. Uh, some of you might be familiar that the UK decided in 2011 to increase the gender diversity on its corporate boards to 25% by 2015 without the introduction of quotas, but instead by relying on behavioral insights. So we've worked a bit with the various groups involved. Specifically for us, it was Vince Cable, the Secretary of Business, uh, in thinking about how behavioral insights could be helpful. And this is the brochure that they showed to us in 2013 when we were first approached, showing that 17% of board members were female. Here's what concerned us. Sometimes descriptive norms can turn into prescriptive norms, not just describing how the world is, but suggesting how the world should be. And so we were nervous about this depiction of reality because it might suggest to us that, yes, the right thing to do is to have a small fraction of women on boards. So we redesigned the cover page and uh, focused instead on the organization which already have diverse boards. It's the same sample, the 100 um, biggest companies, the FTSE 100 companies in the UK. But what we were focusing on was who and what fraction of the 100 largest companies are already diverse. And at that time, that was 94%, signaling that the thing to do was to join the club and be diverse. So if you're interested in learning more about some of these um, findings, uh, we've created an online platform, the Gender Action Portal, uh, which is searchable, where people can find, more, find out more about what works to close gender gaps in economic opportunity, but also in health, education, and political participation. I'm happy to take questions, comments, thoughts. Hi. Hi. My name is Marta. I have a question about, I just want to hear your thoughts on motherhood, because I've been reading a lot about how you know we can do a lot up front to recruit more women, but there's a lot of bias associated with women once they get to a point where they're considering having children. Um, I myself am not, I'm thinking I might not want children, which is a whole other conversation about the reactions I get for that. But there's an immediate assumption right after a woman gets married, I feel even here, um, that their productivity might decrease because their priorities will change. And I'm trying to reconcile that with women I hear saying, in fact, their priorities do change along with fathers who say the same. So yes. just love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, in fact, I'm going to draw on some of your own research at Google. <laughs> so as you can tell, I, I, mean, I, I uh, am a fan of Laszlo Box book work rules. And when Google realized that uh, women were more likely to leave than men, they analyzed the data. And the data told them that it wasn't actually women who were more likely to quit, but it was young mothers. And Google being Google then could increase its parental leave and uh, both, in fact, not just for mothers, but also for fathers, young fathers. And now, apparently, doesn't have a gender gap in uh, likelihood of leaving anymore. So that's, um, I think, the power of data and the power of something that is more clearly more than behavioral design. And that is kind of taking into consideration that people have lives out of, outside of their jobs and that we have to accommodate those lives and those needs um, to make sure that the employees can also um, thrive in our organizations. So parental leave policies, again, this is beyond um, behavioral design. This is just now the economist speaking based on uh, the economic evidence on that. Uh, parental leave policies are quite possibly uh, the most powerful tool we can use to decrease the motherhood penalty that you allude to. Now, what of course it doesn't correct for are the biases that we have, the stereotypes that go um, with seeing, for example, a pregnant woman. And there isn't a lot of research suggesting that there is something like a motherhood penalty and that yes, uh, mothers do earn less than fathers and that in fact, uh, the correlation goes the other way around, that um, men tend to make more money, money when they have children and women tend to make less money when they have children. 
Um, so I do think the, the biases, the stereotypes are absolutely you know, well and alive. And by becoming aware of them, we won't solve the problem. But in fact, um, I applaud Google. I'm not just saying this here. I say this in my book also. I applaud Google for going to the data and really trying to understand you know, what is happening here and then trying to fix what's actually broken. So generally, by the way, a bigger answer to your question is I am um, skeptical that we will ever be able to overcome our biases as human beings until we see something different. So for example, let me run the following thought experiment with you. Maybe orchestras could, the major orchestras in this country, could remove the curtains now. Because now that we have almost 40% female musicians, maybe we're starting to associate, building on the India evidence, we're starting to associate um, playing music with women, and maybe we don't need the curtains anymore. Now, of course, I might be wrong, right? This is an experiment yet to be run. But the evidence that we have so far from, in particular from India, where numbers have changed very quickly because of quotas, makes me kind of optimistic that when we see the change, eventually our mindsets can change. But I don't think by just being aware, for example, that there's a motherhood penalty, we will perceive mothers differently. OK. Oh, no, one more question. <laughs> I can't can't let only one question happen here. Um, about the um, resume bias, uh, that's pretty well known by now. Plenty of research on that, especially with both minorities and women. But um, my understanding is that there's there may be similar bias at the interview stage. And I was reading an article recently about this. And apparently, there are companies now that uh, have sprung up to essentially what they do is to do screening, but the way they do screening is they give tests mm. that are designed by mm. the hiring companies mm. and submit the test results to the company and have, you know, without yeah. any sort of identifying information with them at all mm -hmm. and have the companies first select candidates that they will interview based only on these test scores. And then um, apparently, according to what I've read, this tends to also increase the number of women who eventually get hired because they don't get screened out at an individual interview stage. And I, I wish I remembered more of the details of this, but I'm wondering what you know or think about this, yeah. this yeah. part of it. Thank you for the question. I discussed it at great length in the book. So uh, absolutely, um, the best predictor of future performance, and that's, again, not rocket science, is a work sample test. So when I hire a research assistant, that is not very hard for me. I can give the person a problem, ask her to do some data analysis, run some regressions, write a short report, and that's a very good predictor of how well the person is going to perform in the future. So a work sample test is the best predictor of future performance, full stop. One of the worst predictors of future performance are unstructured interviews. Now, Social scientists, that's actually not new news. Social scientists have been trying to convince the world that unstructured interviews um, are bad predictors of future performance for about 50 years. So being a behavioral scientist, I actually don't believe that we'll ever convince people to give up the interviews, right? If 50 years, either we are bad communicators and that might be part of it, who knows? But in any case, I think this, we're, we're clinging to interviews. Um, and even, so I served as academic dean of the Kennedy School for a few years. I could not imagine hiring a new faculty member without having talked to them. So I'm totally guilty of that. At least I use a structured interview. So that's why I, my recommendation would be to combine a work sample test with a structured interview, right? which at least is using a structured process. And structured interviews are actually better, better able to predict future performance. Um, but there are companies now, and it's super exciting, super interesting to see, which do away with resumes completely. And instead, just do the work sample test. I mean, it's exactly right. This is exactly right. Um, and then only the very last stage um, of the process, they actually see people face to face and interview the last 10 or the last five, and, but using structured structure protocols. So I think it's very, very appealing to think um, of the kinds of tests that you could use and uh, to, in fact, predict future um, performance. Here's one thing where the interview is helpful. And that is, of course, you will probably think 
that right now, and you're of course right. In an interview, we're not just evaluating a job candidate, but we're also telling something about our companies or our organizations, right? So it's, it's also a bit of a sales pitch on my end. And that's okay as long as you're done with your evaluations, right? At the end, I'm very comfortable, and I did that too. I'm very comfortable to have an unstructured part and talk about synchronized swimming and talk about the teaching load at Harvard and, you know, our wonderful students or whatever else it might be. Um, that is different from me trying to evaluate a job candidate. Um, just one more thing, and then I'm, I'm going to call it the next question. But um, the best evidence, if you need evidence on kind of, you know, what interviews, not, not made the best, but one of the, one that kind of drove the point home to me was a bit of an eye opener, comes out of Texas. So a few years back, the state of Texas realized they didn't have enough physicians. And so what they did is they went back to their medical schools and told them that they have to increase the intake of new students by about a quarter. So this one medical school um, that analyzed the data uh, at Houston had already admitted 150 students, the top ranked students, and now in May, at the very late in the academic year, had to go back to the rejected applicants and admit 50 of the initially rejected people. In fact, the people they had to admit at that point were ranked between 700 and 800. These are basically all people who nobody else wanted. And they thought initially, of course, catast catastrophe, you know, uh, now, anyway, they will never make it here. And, um, but of course, it's turned out into being a quasi-experiment, allowing researchers to follow the 150 top-ranked students and the 50 lowly-ranked students over many years to see whether that initial evaluation system correlated in any way with how they performed in medical school and post-medical school. You know, I wouldn't tell you, of course, if <laughs> you know where I'm going, correlation non-existent. Doesn't matter whether you were initially 788 or number two, you did quite equally as well in medical school and post-medical school. So something clearly was wrong with their evaluation system. So then they went back to the evaluation system, which heavily, turns out, was heavily based um, on uh, interviews. About a third of the final score was due to more quantitative measures, such as previous grades, letters of recommendation, uh, work experience before you went to medical school. And two thirds were based on these interviews. So if you take out the interview score, then at least you get a little bit of a correlation between the quantitative scores and future performance. So the interview was just making things worse. Um, in fact, the, uh, the authors of the research paper concluded at the end that a better mechanism would be to just use a lottery rather than interviews. So that's just one study. There's many of those. But truly, unstructured interviews are kind of really discredited in uh, social science. Yes, please. Well, I'd like to start by saying that I do a lot of interviewing myself, and if we could talk Google into, you know, dropping interviews, I'd be, I'd be thrilled. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a, one of the issues that we have in, uh, in hiring women for engineering is the, is the pipeline. I mean, we're yeah. trying to hire right now, and yes. just the resumes coming in, it's, it's, you know, male, 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 female, male, male, you know. It's, yeah. it's just very hard. So I'm, I'm wondering if you've thought from a you know, behavioral psychology standpoint of how do we address that? Is there something that we can do to um, per persuade all the young women out there that, that computers are fun, you know, yeah. it's a good job, it's well yeah. you know. Yeah. Join, join us, Jump, come, come on in, the water's fine. Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and pipeline issues are real. Um, and I, you know, again, when, when I work with organizations, I quite literally look at, you know, what is the pipeline and when do we start to see, for example, underproportional or overproportional promotions, uh, which then would suggest that maybe there's some bias going on. But the pipeline issues are real. So last week um, I spoke at two different conferences. One was uh, Women in STEM. And uh, I was actually, I uh, chaired a panel. But we had a number of very interesting um, NGOs and startups uh, working with schools. And the kind of things I learned there were, you know, astonishing to me as well, that Algebra 2 is not taught at most of our public schools in the United States, that uh, most of our teachers are not equipped to teach Algebra 2. Um, so many of the, so, so first of all, you know, many of our students aren't even equipped with the kind of tools that companies like 
Google, for example, needs. That doesn't explain the gender bias yet, but just more generally. And so what they're doing is they go into school, uh, many of them, uh, versions of providing kind of help to teachers. So one um, project was uh, science from scientists. I'm just getting scientists into schools, helping teachers teaching science. Many of them were focused on uh, girls, uh, primarily or exclusively. Um, also providing mentoring, sponsorship, support systems. Um, so that's kind of one thing. The other conference I just spoke at was on Saturday, was women in math at Harvard. And again, I learned some interesting things. And some are kind of really ripe for some design changes. Um, some of you might have studied math mathematics and will remember that it's super competitive. Um, to get into the best um, schools like Harvard or MIT, um, apparently you need to participate in lots of competitions already in high school. And it turns out that uh, much research suggests that women do not like competitions. It's a bit similar to you know, willingness to take risk, uh, self-confidence. We also tend to, we tend to want um, our work to be evaluated for what it is and not necessarily uh, participate in hyper-competitive environments. So lots of um, research suggesting that that um, might actually decrease the likelihood that women will choose those kinds of fields. So I think it's a combination of enabling boys and girls to do the work and enabling our teachers to teach the kinds of subjects of providing role models, mentorship, same-sex teachers. So lots of evidence suggesting that same-sex teachers, in particular in counter-stereotypical subjects, matter. So this, of course, for girls would be math and science. For boys, reading and writing, so equally as serious. Um, so all of those um, kind of we need, we need to attack. Um, and then think about kind of the designs that people are in, such as you know, the hyper-competition that seems to be apparent in mathematics, and whether that's really necessary for people to succeed and become good mathematicians. Um, we were ooh, this is tall. We were lucky enough to have Gina Davis talk at our headquarters in Mountain View a couple weeks back about. All right, you know where I'm going to say yes. uh, her her take on uh, how the media can yes. help make the world better. By you know, you talked about changing out the portraits in the hallway, and she's talking about can we change the the things that we see in movies and TV to mm -hmm. uh, help solve this issue. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious what your thoughts on that and uh, whether you can say. Yeah. That. Um, so she and I were at the same place in California in October, spoke at the same place, and um, she might have told you that as well as uh, some research that I wasn't actually aware of, that when we represent groups of people, then the typical group is like one third or a quarter female and two thirds or three quarters male. Um, so yes, I completely agree with her. Um, I think the evidence on seeing is believing is really overwhelming and the kind of goes back to the earlier question also the kinds of books that our kids read the kind of cartoons that they watch and that's why ray i mean was you know half a joke but half serious it does matter um, what we see what people wear how we you know represent um, different characters whether on the screen or in a book or on our walls so i yes i am completely completely aligned with her yeah Okay, I just got the time. Um, I think we have to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>